I met Mayor Barber in 1931 in New York on his first visit to America and uh, at the time he spoke about the center was 10 years later when uh, we were in, uh, in 1940 we were in India and um, he called uh, Norina Machiavelli and myself and uh, said it was necessary that we return to the United States and look for a center for him and uh, he described it he did, said he didn't care where it was, anywhere in the United States, providing it had uh, certain qualifications. And the first one was that it had to be in equable climate. And he described it as not too hot in summer for northerners or too cold in winter for southerners. So right away we knew that it couldn't be the New England states or it couldn't be Florida. And then he said that it um, had to have ample water. Mm. He stressed that. And then the next third one was it had to be on virgin land. Not undiscovered land, but land where no one had ever lived. And that sounds so simple to me at that time because I thought America, uh, you know, out west and different places, there were all sorts of places that uh, where nobody had lived. Mm. And then he said it had to be ample property with good soil and it had to be given from the heart. Well that in one sense uh, made it easy uh, because we knew that if we found the right property it would be given from the heart because only Baba could touch someone's heart. Mm. So we never went looking for someone for something that was um, how much is it from, from a price point of view. You ask if I was a disciple or a follower of Baba's? I was neither a follower nor a disciple when I first came of Baba, to Baba because I really didn't know anything about him. It was only after meeting him that made me feel I have never met anybody like him before and I was drawn almost like a magnet to whatever he stood for. The only things I ever heard at the beginning was that he said he had come not to teach, I have come to awaken not, and not to teach, to awaken the consciousness of the Christ spirit within and that appealed to me very much because I remember from a child on even to the day today those words from the New Testament I live yet not I but the Christ liveth in me of St. Paul's I've lived with since I was 14 and I never ever expected to be able to experience that as I did experience it after having been many, many years with Mahababa in India and elsewhere, suddenly dawned on me what it really meant to say the Christ lives within. And that appealed to me very much from Baba. And then when Baba stressed so much that practical life and the spiritual life should be harmoniously and live together, it wasn't spiritual to avoid the practical and disappear away into monasteries or convents where you weren't in touch with the world of illusion and duality but to find God in the illusion and the duality was what Baba wanted. He says the aim of life is to love God and the goal of life is to become one with God. And, uh, and although my hobbies had been, I was a music teacher before I came to Baba for 15 years and my um, interest had been mysticism, the Christian mystics and I never thought I was ever going to realize that there had been such a thing as mysticism in the world long before the Christian era. And then when I came in touch with Eastern mysticism, I realized how much we had in common. And Baba had always said, the East has to come to the West and the West has to come to the East. They both have something to contribute to life. And therefore gradually I began to feel, well, what is it about Baba that draws me to him? And I could only answer it by a certain feeling that I'd never experienced such love before. It's a sort of divine love. It's like a magnet that drew you to him. And it must have been that because he stayed with my parents for the first night. And the next morning he left to go down to the retreat in the south of England. And as he got into the car, and the car was going, this is in 1931, September the 12th, 
and he turned to me and he was then not speaking but he had his alphabet board and he said is there anything you want and I hadn't any time to think but I could hear the car waiting and anxiously to get off the long drive of seven hours to the country and I said yes I said greater opportunities for service and a greater capacity to love and then out of the blue came oh yes and perhaps spontaneous goodness and Baba just spelled out on his board you'll have soon all those things that you have asked for and that it was left like that and then within three days I was finding that that was exact, exactly what I was going to do that my love for Baba was going to take the form of active service love and service selfless service and from that day to the present that is 52 years that is what I've been doing that the love I felt when I first met Baba translated itself immediately into selfless love and selfless service which I feel is the goal of life yes, yes. and that is so now you can call me a disciple if you want but it's an active uh, disciple and it's the outcome of love there's no such thing as static love love has to be active and Baba very much stresses voluntary work but he also says don't lean on each other therefore it's practical to have a career to, to work but if it's your opportunity to do voluntary work and serve mankind that's even better yes, but he said the spiritual life consists in turning selfishness into selflessness and lust into purity and greed into, gen into generosity so that is as you might say the things that appealed to me yes, because I was brought up in late Victorian times and Protestantism wasn't very broad in those days and think of the East as not being heathen but of being one with us and then of course I think Baba's great message was that truth is oneness Pilate never answered that when he asked that question Jesus never answered it but Baba has always said separateness is ignorance and oneness is the truth. The truth is that we are one, whatever our color, whatever our creed, and that there are many paths to God, and that you have to search for yourself to find the path which brings you closest to God. Okay. Remembering always that the aim of life is to love God, and the goal of life is to become one with God. And Baba also stressed, which interested me, that faith and love, rather like the Catholic Church in a way that faith and love are gifts to grace so then we said to Baba well if faith and love are gifts to grace what can we do then to serve you so Baba said to try to please God and you know it's in pleasing God that you learn how to love him more and I think that appealed to me too and that's the way I think my last years of life shall I say that I think that is one let every thought, word, and deed be what you feel will be pleasing to God. So that is what drew me to Baba. Well, let's let's talk about the center then, and how the center relates to to your feeling of service. Yes. To now, to what what the center means to be at to try to attain oneness. Yes, absolutely. The center. Baba had said when I was in India, he said, one day I want to have a center in the West because the East has to come to the West and I want it to be suitable for Easterners as well as Westerners. And therefore he sent Elizabeth Patterson, who was with me in India at the time, back to um, this country to find a place and he laid down the five principles which you know. And uh, she looked, as you know, for four years and she found Myrtle Beach as suitable for what Baba wanted and Baba came over here to open it in 1952 now I had been 18 years in India with Baba watching him work with the lepers and the poor and living the way of life because he said if we had lived the way that Christ had taught there's no need for another manifestation of God but it is because Christians have not lived the life that Christ taught or the Buddhists the life that Buddha taught or Zoroastrian, the life that Zoroastrian taught, that it was necessary from time to time that God manifests himself as a prophet or as a great soul, that we might know what love for God really means. So you see, Baba wanted to have a place where we could all come together and share 
biggest, Baba's greatest lesson, I think, is that we must share with each other. Therefore, he wanted a center where Easterners and Westerners from all over the world could come and live the way of life which he wanted, which was sharing with one another the feeling of oneness amongst each other. You can talk about God in the center as easily as you can talk of your profession or your card or your family life. It's a topic which all people are interested in. That is the goal of life, to find God as your real self. Therefore, to do that, you must share. You cannot get very far if you are all closed in. You know how difficult it is to communicate, and when you're with Baba, it's so easy to communicate. He comes down to your level and brings you up to his. Because he never preaches at you. Therefore, the center has served a real purpose of bringing people together. When I was here when it opened, I was here when the center opened, and that was um, in 1952, and people from all over, there were about three or four hundred here, black and white, and Baba was there just to meet them. And what they all felt was this consciousness of love. And Baba said, I will never leave the center. My consciousness will always remain here. And that's what people come for, for that renewal of the spiritual life. They'll come just for one night or two nights, and they'll go back to New York, they'll go back from wherever they've come, and they feel renewed in spirit. And today you must for yourself feel that need to get away from the hustle and bustle of life and be able to communicate with God in the peace and the quietness. And that's what we are begging and longing that this place will be kept for that very purpose. It certainly will. We were staying with Baba at a small hotel uh, near Portofino. Uh, in, it was in Santa Margarita, really. And um, after a bit, the whole hotel got filled up with people who were visiting Baba. And um, it was, we had a lovely time there with Baba, walking over the hills, and uh, Baba was uh, very, very full of light and life and we walked over these lovely hills and Baba was with us all the time. Now, this, what I'm going to tell you is about Baba and an amusing dancing lesson he had. He, um, everyone, most of the other disciples had gone out to the, have their passports put right or something. I really don't know what was wrong with them because my passport was all right and Delia was all right. Was all right. But the others all had to go and have something done. So Delia and I were in the garden of this hotel alone and suddenly Baba appeared. He looked very beautiful as usual but full of, uh, full of mischief and uh, love, lots of love but there was still a touch of mischief there. And he came up and he said um, to us, well what should we do? And as I've already told you, he had told us that he'd come to meet us on our level, so I had what I thought was a joke, and I said, uh, well, let's leave the universe and have some fun, Baba. Let leave the universe for the afternoon. So Baba nodded his head and looked delighted at the idea of leaving the universe. And, um, and first of all, he jumped on my back. That was the first piece of leaving the universe, and then he broke my back. But... Um, uh, he then said um, that he would like to have a dancing lesson. So Chanji took his hand and brought him to class and um, asked a few of the usual questions one asks a new pupil. And then I took his hand and <coughs> I did one, two, three hop, almost like a polka step in front, going forward. And he joined in immediately. There was no having to learn it. And we danced all around the garden, and it was like flying. Baba was his hair flying and his white robe fl flying, and we were both doing one, two, three hop all around this garden, right round to we. And it was quite a long way, but I've never uh, felt such lovely dancing in my life. I mean, it really was inspiring to move with Baba like that. And um, then. I think I, sh I showed him something else, but it wasn't quite such a, an excitement and as, as such a beauty as the first step. And uh, that, was the, that was Baba's dancing lesson. Um, uh, 
Mary Starr, in telling us about Baba, told us a lot of things that were wrong, about the things we should not be allowed to do if you followed Baba, and things that were wrong to do. And uh, among other things, he told us that we should not make up. Mayor Baba would not like it, and very strict about not making up. So we were in Paris that Christmas, and Baba said uh, he was going home by Marseille, and he said, "Well, um, Margaret shall take me to Marseille and uh, see, see me on the ship. She has such excellent French, which wasn't true at all, but I didn't correct it. My French was awful. It's real good English French." But uh, I accepted it, and uh, I went with Baba alone to um, Marseille. Chanji was with us, and I think uh, Kaka. I don't know. There were two of the men disciples. And we went down to Paris by train. And I slept in the next compartment to Baba, and all night long Baba knocked on the wall. Every hour on the hour, practically. And uh, it turned out he meant, I love you. So I didn't get much sleep that night, and we arrived at Marseille early in the morning, and went down to the, we, we took Baba's luggage to the ship, he was going to Salem, and then we went back to the uh, quay at Marseille to have breakfast. And uh, we were sitting there, and I, I must have looked like nothing on earth, not having had much sleep at night, and no makeup on my poor face. And Baba looked at me rather and as if he were not too pleased with the sight. And he suddenly went, he suddenly tapped his face like this. And I thought, well, I don't know what that means. And I looked at Chanji for help, and Chanji didn't know either. So he did it again. And I thought, a sort of joy came, a little joy came, and I thought, well, perhaps he means I may put on a little powder, but he can't bear this. So I got up my powder puff and showed it to Baba. He did this again. I thought, well, he can't mean rouge. After all, Meredith said they couldn't possibly. However, I got my rouge out, and I showed it to Baba, and Baba <laughs> and sent me off to make her up in the ladies' room which was uh, quite a lesson as to what is wrong and what would lead one to God or anything else. It certainly wasn't going without makeup. Um, this is a song we sang for Baba, or at least this is part of the song. We are the girls of Baba's camp you heard so much about, and everybody stares at us whenever we go out. Now this was my verse. For I am just Suleika. I thought that I could dance. I've lost my school, I've lost my hope, and I think I've lost my chance. Then we sang all together towards Baba. We sang it straight to Baba. We sang um, the last line was the punch line of the song. For we are not God realized, but we hope it's so with you. And we all come to we also wrote a play, also t uh, taking off what Baba had been doing. Uh, we each took our own, we became our own selves at about 70 years old. I think this was rather a prophetic play anyway. And um, Delia was very old and Minta was very old and I played um, Norina's part. They left me out altogether. I played Norina's part. And at that time, Baba had been um, playing us up, or playing up a game, with about the perfect boy. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But he said that there was a perfect boy that had to be found, and that he was somewhere in Europe, and this boy had to be found. Well, Kitty was sent to Scotland, and she brought back a boy who was rather cross-eyed and an extraordinary-looking creature, and he got sent back. He was to be the handsomest boy in the world. Norina was sent here, and other people were sent to other places. So we based the play on this perfect boy. Um, we, we were very old, and we were sitting around the table, and um, I was copying Norina's remarks. Fantastic, I said at intervals and so on. And... Um, uh, uh, there was um, 
a lot of it, but the, the point was, finally, the door opened and in came Quentin Todd with um, a hat on his uh, head with a feather at the back and shorts and a coat, and he walked in, and we were all delighted. I think the boy at last, this must be the boy, said everybody. Uh, so we asked him questions. We said, do you speak English? And he said, oh, yes, yes. Do you speak French? Oh, oui, oui. Do you speak German? Yeah, yeah. And Russian? Da, da. And we all looked at each other with great delight. Like, this is the boy at last. And then Baba will do this, and Baba will speak directly. This beast knows this boy is found. Well, just at this moment, the door opened again, and in came Kaka, dressed as a mailman, with a letter addressed to Norina. Uh, no, it was a telegram. A telegram addressed to Norina, which she tore open, and it said, owing to the, owing to a, a, an eruption of Vesuvius, I shall not be speaking on April the 1st. And we all fainted, except Delia, who put up her arms and she said, I still believe. It was a very intimate holiday, a really, uh, what you call a Sahavas, keeping company with the master. And it was a unique time because we were with Baba in Italy, which he loved. There was warmth, beautiful sunshine, and the sea. Baba had a balcony from his room facing the sea. and. We did many excursions during that time and we used to walk along, go to the rocks and he'd sit on the rocks with us and some of us would bathe. And so it was this extraordinary intimate atmosphere which Chansey said amazed him because up to then only those few women in India had had this sort of life with Baba. Baba went out on the terrace and we all sat round him and he was sort of reclining and he had on this most beautiful royal blue jacket and the moon was shining straight on his face and then there was the scent of the jasmine and the sound of the cicadas and it was one of those timeless beautiful moments with Baba. We just sat there never said a word. Well I feel Baba treated us rather like children and he was, he knew in the future we would need that love he was giving us and as we had to keep coming back to the West and facing our problems and also many of us were going to face a world war and therefore he had to keep feeding us each little trip something different happened and he gave us this to keep us faithful and steadfast I think that was the meaning of it really